On this episode of Urban U, CUNY students at the state-of-the-art New York Simulation Center get the opportunity for an immersive educational experience that trains them for real-life clinical scenarios. Our student correspondent for the month brings news out of Hunter College. We look at the stars from the City College Planetarium and talk with a Brooklyn College Distinguished Lecturer who's working with the biggest stars in film. That and more, welcome to Urban U. Every day, doctors, nurses, and other medical staff have to make split-second life-or-death decisions. So how do you train young clinicians to think quick and save lives? Well, that's where the New York Simulation Center, or NYSIM, comes in. For more than a decade, NYSIM has let young clinicians put their newly acquired clinical care skills to the test before working with actual patients. The center is housed at New York's historic Bellevue Hospital, the nation's first public hospital and still one of the largest in the country. Dr. Patricia Semino boyce began her nursing career at Bellevue and is now CUNY's University Dean for Health and Human Services. An alumna of Hunter College herself, she is now on the steering committee of NYSIM. In the last 11 years, approximately 25,000 learners come through from across 14 of our campuses. The center also provides training for students from NYU Langone Medical Center as NYSIM is a public-private partnership between both institutions. During our NYSIM visit, we met two students from Hunter College's nursing program. Gregory Birozhansky is a senior pursuing a traditional four-year nursing degree at Hunter, while Marissa Chuku is a student in Hunter's accelerated second-degree nursing program, which allows candidates with a college degree in or out of the sciences to earn a bachelor's in nursing completing 51 credits in just 18 months. I was a pre-health student when I got my first bachelor's degree in biology, and I know I've always wanted to work with patients. And for a student like Greg, hands-on training at NYSIM is already paying dividends. We check everything about the patient. That prepared me going into this internship that I have at Memorial Sloan Kettering, because now when I did need to go in and check a patient's vital signs or any other thing I need to perform with the patient, I already knew uh, the basis of it. And it's critical for our health and human service programs to be able to provide simulated learning experiences to build confidence and competence of our students before they enter practice. Like so many CUNY students, Greg and Marissa had a unique path that brought them to Hunter College in NYSIM. Marissa was born in New Jersey and raised in Nigeria. She returned to the U.S. for her first bachelor's degree in biology at Washington State University. Greg's journey to a nursing career seemed like a predestined family affair. My grandmother was a nurse and my mother is a nurse right now. And I knew that I had to continue on being a nurse because I've seen them. They inspired me become a nurse, they're a very strong woman, especially my mother. She came here to America with no English, no language, but she managed to make it through nursing school. I want to take what they did and move on, maybe move on to a nurse practitioner or CRNA. The hands-on training received at NYSIM comes in different forms. There are task trainers, which help practice specific tasks like tracheal intubation, vascular access, and ultrasound. High fidelity mannequins provide a 360 degree simulation and the most lifelike of details. The patient has pulses in his feet, it's amazing. We also, in addition to mannequins here, have what we call standardized patients, which are actors that are serving in the role of patients, so that would, they would be really human, lifelike, and direct um, communication and interactions with people in a patient role. All of the student interactions can be monitored and feedback provided during or after the simulation. When they recount their simulated training experiences, it seems that NYSIM is instilling confidence and then some. We're very hands-on. Just touching the equipment is a big step in learning how to use the equipment because you get more confident using it in real practice. So regardless of the medical career you choose and regardless of which CUNY school you're doing your degree at, there's a very good chance you'll end up here at NYSEM to get hands-on experience. I'm Andrew Falzone for Urban U. My name is Delaney Inoa Reynoso. I was born in the Dominican Republic. I was raised here and I came here in 2004. I feel like my foster mom is what got me to focus on school more. Cause when I went into foster care, I was like, I don't know, like I was at a point where I was just like tired. I was just, I was just tired. And I was just tired of the pressure. 
because this it, it's pressure where you don't want to study because you feel like you need it to better yourself. You're, it's like you're studying because you need to prove your parents wrong or because you need to prove everybody else wrong. And I feel like that's wrong. So she she got to me and she was like, you know, you need to go to school. And if you really think that you can be a doctor, then do that. And so I did. I don't want to do it to tell people that they have cancer. I want to do it because I want to tell them that I'm going to cure it or that it's going to stop, you know, or that I'm going to help. You know, I don't, I don't think about it in the negative way. I think about how can we fix this, you know, how can we move forward. I look forward to fulfilling what makes me happy. Like, I don't want a job because I'm getting paid good money. I don't want a job because I have to be there. I want a job because that's what I want to do and that's what I like to spend my time doing. I don't only want to do it because of me. I want to do it because I'm part of a minority group. So the fact that one of us moves out of that group and becomes somebody in life, it motivates the others. You don't see that many Hispanic doctors. You don't see doctors that speak Spanish. And it's, that, that's crazy. You know how many patients are like Spanish speaking or speak another language that it's not English and then everything is in English. So, you know, we, we, we need that. We need the diversity. To the surprise of many, there is a planetarium in a basement in northern Manhattan. So we're going to turn on time. You could see Mercury moving with respect to the stars. It's in a science building at City College, and the director is Dr. James Hedberg. It's a 30-foot dome, and we have 58 seats. This is our spherical mirror projection system, which we installed about four years ago. And with that, we can take anything on a computer and throw it up on the dome. It was closed during the pandemic, so he kept planetarium fans involved with posts to the website like Mercury Three Years of Celestial Motion. He put even more posts on their Instagram, like showing a solar system being born and revealing the light pollution from Earth's cities. But now the planetarium is open again, and first there were students from the astrophysics class. Okay, so the lights are going to get dark. The constellations you know the most are probably all part of the zodiac. How does this planetarium compare to more luxurious ones? First of all, we use the same software as the big planetariums, but what we can offer that the big ones can't is a much more informal setting. What we can do here are live shows where guests can ask questions or say, hey, can we go to Jupiter? And I can say, of course, let's just turn around and go to Jupiter. The informality means I could even try giving a star show myself. This is Cassiopeia from Greek mythology. You can usually find her in the night sky because she's shaped a little like a W. The planetarium is loved by neighborhood children, including Dr. Hedberg's five-year-old daughter, Viola. Saturn has rings that go around the planet. The planetarium also has a hidden treasure, the original projector that is only rarely taken out for a spin. This is the star ball coming out right now. It's, it's part of the optomechanical projector system. You can see all these little holes in the, in the, in the ball right here. Those are the, the stars, each one carefully drilled in exactly the right place. The Big Dipper. Yeah, that's the Big Dipper. Inside is a really bright light bulb. As you get further down, you into the analog computer, and this is where the planetary motions are calculated using gears and motors. It, it still works. It's amazing. It yeah. still works? Yeah. It's, the light bulb turns on. Um, it makes beautiful stars, too. How did this planetarium get started? This was built in, when the building was built. You have to remember, this was right after the space race, right, in the 60s and 70s, where space was on everyone's mind. and so. All throughout the East Coast, there's high schools and colleges with planetariums in them, built on the hype from the, from the Apollo missions. There was a movie out recently called Don't Look Up about a comet crashing into Earth and destroying everything. We discovered a very large comet. Oh. 
Good for you. It's headed directly towards Earth. This comet is what we call a planet killer. Could that really happen? Smaller ones have hit the Earth before. Um, it's not very likely we'll have another impact anytime soon. What is it about a planetarium that delights people? It immediately whisks you away from the normal world. Uh, it takes you back in time, takes you in the future, takes you to other planets, all while doing it with your friends and colleagues. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. The City University of New York has a whopping 25 colleges. But where did all of them get their names? You know, who's the Gutman in Gutman Community College? Who's the Macaulay in Macaulay Honors College? Who's being hunted at Hunter College? We take you now on a journey around the city to find out the stories behind the names of our CUNY schools. We begin in Manhattan. This month, we'll hit Manhattan's four-year colleges and then round out the rest of the island next time. Manhattan is home to 12 CUNY schools, five of which are these four-year colleges. One is the City College of New York, and that's, of course, rather self-explanatory. The other four have more to their story. What became Baruch College was originally just the business school wing of the aforementioned City College. But by the time it spun off as an independent college in 1968, it had been named the Bernard M. Baruch College. Bernard Manns Baruch was a City College graduate himself. Born in 1870, he was one of the most influential and wealthiest men of the 20th century, amassing his fortune on the New York Stock Exchange. He would be an advisor to Woodrow Wilson during World War I, Franklin Roosevelt during World War II, and was a personal friend of Winston Churchill. Always an engaged public figure until his death in 1965, he would be seen in everything from Bugs Bunny cartoons to Time Magazine. Hunter College, on the other hand, was named for a much more local figure. Established in 1870, it was originally an all-women's teaching school known as the Normal College. And that's all normal meant, a somewhat antiquated term now for what we'd call a teacher's college today. In 1914, the name was changed to honor a founding father of the school. Thomas Hunter, its first president, who served in that role for 36 years, from its inception until 1906. The John Jay College of Criminal Justice was, of course, named for a founding father as well, but on a national scale. Originally formed in 1965 as the College of Police Science, or COPS for short, within a year, it was decided to rename it something more fitting for its educational goals. 
John Jay was chosen. A native New Yorker who was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court certainly seemed to fit the bill. A signatory of the Treaty of Paris ending the Revolutionary War, first de facto Secretary of State under George Washington, and second governor of the state of New York, John Jay's legacy has seen his name on postage stamps, high schools, towns, and of course, our CUNY College. And lastly, the William E. Macaulay Honors College, named after William Edward Macaulay, who only recently died in 2019. A city college grad, he made his fortune as chairman of the private equity firm First Reserve. The school itself is a rather recent addition to CUNY. It was established in 2001 from what was at the time the largest donation ever to CUNY, $30 million from Macaulay himself, lending his namesake in the process. And with that, we wrap up Manhattan's four-year colleges. We'll finish up the rest of Manhattan next time. And as we continue our tour of the names behind our CUNY schools, we'll hit more colleges, more boroughs, and more stories. For the record, I'm Ari Goldberg. Hi, I'm Nora Wesson, your student correspondent for the month, sharing with you some of the exciting things happening here at my school, Hunter College. We're in front of one of the school's iconic buildings, Thomas Hunter Hall. Here you'll find the Hunter Chapter of Hillel, an international Jewish student organization offering tons of events and support. Let's go inside. This is the place to go for Jewish life on campus. With educational, religious, and social events, the Hillel is a place for Jewish students to gather and bond. Every Wednesday, the Jewish Learning Fellowship invites students to learn and discuss Jewish text in a modern context. Every Thursday afternoon is Bagel Brunch, a time when students gather to snack, play games, or relax. The Hillel is an open, welcoming place, and every week is packed with fun activities designed to unite Jewish students from all walks of life. Come check it out. The Hunter Hillel has something for everyone. Streisand, Hanks, Pacino, and De Niro. These are just a few of the stars that Tom Riley, now a distinguished lecturer here at Brooklyn College, has had the opportunity to work with throughout his 30-year career as an assistant director on over 40 major motion pictures. Remember when I worked with Penny Marshall? When I shot Big, she was great, but she said to me, you know, I've never prepped a movie before, so I don't know what to do. I said, that's exactly why I'm here. So talk to me and you tell me what you want. And I'll make it happen for you. Working closely with directors was only part of what Riley did as an AD. One of the first involved on a project, his job could entail setting up the offices, hiring crew, and scouting locations. Once the film began, he ran the day-to-day -day operations, overseeing complex logistics while putting out fires. We solve problems, that's my job. I, I'm not rattled if there's a problem, I expect a problem. I think of a shot we did on uh, The Devil's Advocate with Taylor Hackford. We shut down a big section of Manhattan, so that was extremely challenging. And we did a shot with Keanu Reeves where he comes out of a building after his wife has died and uh, Al Pacino played Satan and he has stopped the world. And we had to have nobody there, no automobiles, no human beings, so we, we literally shut down the world. But even when shooting with stars, Riley tells us working on films was not always as glamorous as people think. I recall doing a City by the Sea, and we're shooting on the Jersey Shore six weeks of nights, which means you go to work at four in the afternoon and rapid sunrise, and we're shooting with uh, Robert De Niro and James Franco. And they were dressed not unlike I'm dressed now or you're dressed. This was sort of a fall movie, but we're shooting in the winter. So their uh, wardrobe was very thin. We were out there, it was 12 degrees, February, nights, wind howling off the ocean, you know, for six hours, just brutally cold. They just have to tough it out. Gordy Willis used to say, it's not all autographs and sunglasses, and I, but he said it beats mining coal. Well, working on the film Just Cause with Sean Connery, safety was a concern. I'll always remember it being very difficult shooting the Everglades on Just Cause, just because of the danger. Uh, my first scout, I think I, we counted, and I was counting by tens, about 200 alligators. So it looked like an old Tarzan movie. But they were really close. We were on a little bridge about a foot off the water and 10, 15 feet away. You know, the, 
gators come up and their eyes come out of the water and so forth. So it's very sobering. And uh, you learn about alligators. One, they can run faster than a man. Two, the big ones can be 15 feet long, which is like the size of a Jeep, they're big. Uh, we were there in mating season, so they were really going anywhere they wanted. So we actually had to duplicate the set and we built a, a swamp about the size of a, you know, a, a basketball gymnasium with thousands of plants and water. But despite the pressures of making sure that things ran smoothly, Riley says that it was all worthwhile. What are some of the most rewarding things that you've gotten out of being in films? The camaraderie of working in this very close-knit community of very talented people uh, is very rewarding. And then, of course, you get to see your finished product up on the screen. I approached my job always as I'm making the best movie of the year. Because I can't get up in the morning, go to work for 12 hours, and know that you know, I'm wasting my time. So you have to really be into it and try your best and, uh, and try to do what you can to make the best movie you can. And even if, if you, you know, shoot in brutal conditions and tough neighborhoods or, you know, I've shot it in the mountains when it's 10 below zero, that kind of thing, it's miserable. But at the end of the day, you see the movie and you can watch the movie forever. And uh, it's very satisfying to know that you were part of something. I had a 35 year history in the film business working with probably 80 Academy Award winners, many great people behind the camera. So working at Brooklyn College is, uh, has been a fantastic experience because I'm able in the classroom to bring my experience to the students. I'm Scott Kirby for Urban U. Hello. Welcome to Questioning, Reginald. How are you? What is this about? The Brooklyn College Undergraduate Film Festival had been an annual tradition until coronavirus caused it to end. But this year, 46 student films were screened. And at Danto, the film department chair, explains the goals of their thesis films. It is designed to demonstrate, for the students to demonstrate, what they learned in all three years of the program. Brooklyn College is one of the most diverse programs in the country. We see a range of opinions, a range of background experiences. We have students of all ages, all racial, religious, ethnic backgrounds. That leads to great diversity in stories, in the quality of films. Cesar Monroy Jimenez directed his thesis film this past year. Cesar moved to the U.S. when he was seven. I took inspiration from this story from my own personal life. You know, I, my, my mother brought us to the States and my brother and I saw a struggle a lot. So we had to take a lot of adult responsibilities and basically grow up quicker than most uh, children our age. Why We Work tells the story of a woman cleaning homes and living on the edge of poverty. She is a cleaning lady and she's just trying to give her son any sense of a normal life. She's very, very low income. She's struggling with poverty. Um, and she's trying to hide this fact from her son Coming into Brooklyn College and really being pushed to really develop a story that you know and tell a story that I think would be compelling to a lot of people, I realized that this was a story for me to tell. We do tell students, tell the story that you know the best. Tell the story that, that only you can tell, that it's coming from your life or the life of the people near, uh, dear to you. The stories that we have here are the stories of their lives. Robert Tutak is a longtime film professor at Brooklyn College. He's well aware of the real world challenges that many of his students face. The body of our students, they come from lower income families. A lot of them work for a living. Their stories are fascinating. Their stories are different. Their stories are unique. Professor Tutak acknowledges the pressure that the pandemic put on filmmaking, a creative forum that relies heavily on in-person collaboration. Because of the trauma of the additional restrictions that the students were facing making their films, because of the emotional investment that they had to make in order to actually get through the process. These are, these are much more seriously personal stories. Cesar Monroy Jimenez is grateful for the lessons from his Brooklyn College teachers. It was very emotionally compelling because of the criticism, because of the advices that you know, the professors at Brooklyn College gave me.
having little resources and, and having great instructors really push you to tell the best story that you can. For Urban U, I'm Craig Thompson. Tune in next month for more CUNY stories, including the ongoing Baruch exhibit, Who Speaks for the Oceans, that encourages new ways to shift our understanding of whales and other non-human animals. Thank you for watching these stories from the largest urban university, the City University of New York. <laughs>